It's Saturday, March 6th. Welcome back to the program. This is the Frank Roach Show. I'm your host, Frank Roach. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the channel, like the video, click the bell for notifications. Tell your friends and family to do the same. Trying to build up a little channel here. Takes a long time. There's so many podcasts out there. Just incredible. And some really great ones, of course. My focus is typically economics, politics, geopolitics, foreign affairs, finance, financial markets, hot topics, current events. All right, today is going to be a jobs conversation, jobs and credit, jobs and credit. We had this past week, since it was the first week of the month, when Friday isn't the first, we had the ADP employment report out, we had the employment situation report, and as always, every Thursday, we have initial claims data, so we can get a good sense for the labor market in the U.S. right now. Also want to check in on some data from the Federal Reserve about outstanding consumer debt, new records. And of course, we still have new records of federal debt every day. Over the past month, federal debt's up $193 billion to $34.4 trillion. Ouch. Anyway, checking on jobs market. The employment situation report comes out the first Friday of every month. It's not the first of the month. And so that was out yesterday, Friday comes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And this data has been a little bit unusual for the past few years. Total non-farm employment rose by 303,000 for the month of March. The unemployment rate, the narrow measure, U3 rate, was unchanged at 3.8%. So on the headline, another good number. Creating jobs, unemployment remains relatively low. The U6 rate, the broad measure, which is probably the more accurate measure, is 7.4% unemployment. That measure includes discouraged workers, people who have given up trying to find a job because they couldn't find a job for so long. So they certainly should be counted as unemployed. We have a variety of measures of unemployment. You can see them at the BLS.gov. Anyway, among the major groups identified at the BLS, unemployment rate for Blacks, 6.4%, Asians, 2.5%, Hispanics, 4.5%, Adult men, 3.3%. Adult women, 3.6%. Teenagers, 12.6%. Whites, 3.4%. Not a whole lot of change on the month for unemployment. The major areas where jobs were added again, not our best paying, most secure areas of work. Healthcare jobs added 72,000. Government jobs increased 71,000. So what's that? 343,000 jobs right there tied to government. We think of healthcare jobs, we think of government spending. Employment and leisure and hospitality, 49,000. Again, not high paying, secure jobs. Services industry up 16,000. So we have the same situation we've been seeing now for some time. And that is that most of the jobs being created are part time jobs. No full time jobs were created last month. We haven't had a net full time jobs increase for over a year. Part time jobs continue to dominate. We look at part-time jobs for economic reasons and part-time jobs for non-economic reasons. That total comes to 25587 for March of 2023. And for March of 2024, $27,397,000. Full-time jobs, no change. So obviously a real problem there. If, you, if you're not working, get a part-time job, that's great. Part-time jobs are great when you don't have another job or part-time jobs are great when you're a parent or a teenager. Multiple part-time jobs is tough. We look at total multiple job holders. So these are people holding multiple part-time jobs or a full-time job and a part-time job. Went up by 500,000 over the year from March 2023 to March 2024. So again, not the best types of jobs, not the best paying jobs. And moreover, once again, we see that most of the jobs went to foreign nationals. The foreign-born population rose again by some 3 million persons. Participation rate, high, 65.9. Number of employed, 31,114,000 against 29,848,000. Employment population ratio, high, 63.5. You compare that to the native-born population, where the population fell, the civilian labor force fell, the participation rate fell, number of employed fell. And so as we've seen now for some months, to the extent we're getting job creation, it's largely part-time jobs, not in high-paying, secure 
fields, and most of the jobs are going to foreign nationals. This is the jobs we actually count, of course. Remember that we have a massive influx of foreign nationals, illegal immigrants, for the past three years, thanks to Joe Biden's open border policy. And so really cocking up the labor market in ways that makes it hard to, to gauge. You can be sure there's lots of under-the-table work going on around the country, as there always has, but certainly more now. So a, neat, a nice headline report, but the details are not great. And I have to believe the Federal Reserve can do the same analysis that I can do. They have PhD economists working seven days a week on this, and they can see that the details of the labor market are not strong. The headline number is good. And remember now, the BLS, the Fed, government, they consider part-time jobs full-time jobs when it comes to counting jobs and analyzing the market. Now, the other data we wanted to pay attention to is on Thursday, every Thursday at 8.30 a.m., we get initial unemployment claims. These are the number of Americans who lost their job in the prior week and filed for initial unemployment insurance, as we're all entitled to do when we work full-time and we uh, lose our job due to no fault of our own. Once again, some fugazi numbers, honestly. Initial jobless claims for the week ending 30th of March, 221,000. Versus 213 expected versus 212 in the prior week. Initial claims have been pegged at lows from the 1960s and 70s for a better part of two or three years now. And it doesn't make sense. This data is being manipulated. This data is not accurate. The dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens, the hundreds of companies who have been announcing layoffs just in 2024 forgetting the layoffs in 2023, is off the charts. These layoffs are not showing up in the data. For last week, the biggest change in cl claims came from California, Pennsylvania, Iowa, Illinois, New Jersey, Maryland, the usual suspects. Claims fell in Texas, Missouri, Georgia, Arkansas, North Carolina, India, blue states versus red states. But something's wrong with this data. And I suspect this data is going to be revealed to have been manipulated in the January, February 2025 timeframe when re-election won't be such an issue for President Biden. I'm asserting data manipulation on claims data and even unemployment data. And what's peculiar about this is the Biden administration has got themselves in a little bind. They are clearly trying to demonstrate that the economy is relatively strong and that you should all be happy out there and re-elect Joe Biden for running a great economy. And they do this by boosting headline non farm payroll data, then revising it later, and manipulating claims data so that it stays low. I know these are these are assertions. I'm not going to have. I don't have all the proof of this. Of course, won't have it for some time. But what's peculiar here is is by showing a stronger economy to make Americans think that things are going well, and therefore re-elect President Biden. He's also forcing the Federal Reserve to keep interest rates higher longer, or even consider increasing interest rates. But again, I've said it many times, the Democrats are doing nothing to help on the inflationary, inflationary front. And to the extent they're trying to position data that's positive, they're hurting their own cause because you can be sure they'd also like the Fed to lower rates between now and the election. Inflation remains an issue. Gas prices are up again. Energy prices are up again. Anyway, so more concerning news on the data front from claims. Again, headline number, really good, but details, not good. Something's wrong in this claims data. And then on Wednesday, the Wednesday before the employment situation report, which comes out the first Friday of every month, that's not the first of the month. This is from ADP, the national check writing company, the private check writing company, who has unique insights in the hiring and firing of American workers, had an increase of jobs, 184,000 against the employment situation report of 303,000. Private employers added 184,000 jobs in March and ADP does not work for the government, so they don't have government jobs here. And of course, the non-farm payroll data does include government jobs. And so they found that small businesses create about 27,000 jobs. Small businesses with more than 50 employees fell in terms of jobs. Mid-sized companies boosted 63,000. Large companies boosted by 87,000. Most of the jobs for the ADP report came in leisure and hospitality. Again, that very low wage and unstable sector of the economy. Trade, transportation, utilities, construction, 
So a job number that seems to be more in line with the current state of the economy. So the labor market appears to be strong. The labor market is in good shape. I don't think it's as rosy as the data is suggesting. And the reason why is because people are struggling out there to find full-time jobs and working multiple part-time jobs, and the wages aren't that high. We do see some indication that real wages are rising recently, but that may not be sustainable given the re-energized inflation that we see coming through the data. All right, so the other thing on my mind today is I want to talk about the Federal Reserve's regular consumer credit report that they provide each month. And talking about total consumer credit outstanding, it's pretty alarming. New high for total consumer credit outstanding, $5.051 trillion. This does not include mortgage debt. This is revolving and non-revolving debt. So think new car loans, credit cards, personal loans. Total revolving debt, new record, $1.338 trillion. Non-revolving debt, new records, $3.712 trillion. And what's really alarming is that the savings rate obviously is plunging as we use more and more credit that is called this savings. The savings rate in America has dropped to 3.6% while revolving and now revolving credit skyrockets. Credit card debt for revolving credit has just been parabolic, a straight up line. So we have a huge divergence between the, the increase in outstanding revolving credit and the savings rate. And this is really problematic. Not only that, but at the same time, given what the Federal Reserve has been doing and given the greed and horrible behavior of credit card companies, credit card rates are at all-time highs as well. New car loans, personal loans. For all accounts, the average credit card interest rate, 21.59%. Car loans for 60 months, 8.2%. Car loans for 72 months, 8.4%. Personal loans, two-year two year loan, 12.5%. We really have a serious problem here. This Not only does this imply problems coming up in the future, but it also indicates the challenge that households and consumers are under with respect to inflation, salaries, and keeping up their standard of living. And they're doing it on credit card debt. Really dangerous, really dangerous stuff. And so what happens is, when we go into debt, consumption rises. But when we begin to pay that back down, consumption falls. And so there's going to be a price to pay economically here when this debt has to be repaid. And delinquencies are rising. Remember now, these credit events usually are the precursors to recessions. When consumers, businesses, households can't pay back their, their debt, that begins to cascade on banks. And banks are, of course, a critical part of the economy. And to the extent banks are damaged, therefore the lending process is damaged, the circular flow of money in the economy is damaged, and the economy weakens. So we're reaching up above 5% default rates. And that can bring us right back to 2007, 2008 in a similar scenario. Credit events always precede recessions. So we have some real challenges out there when it comes to the job market and the credit market, and they're tied together. Okay, just a few more things. Let's check in on markets. Check in on markets for the week ending the 5th of April. Can't keep a good market down, even though we had a reimagination re of inflation over the week. S&P 500 still finished the week higher. Only up eight points. But my goodness, what a bubble is, is blowing up here in equities. S&P 500 opened the week at 5,196. At a high of 5,255, a low of 5,147, and close at 5,204, up eight points for the week. Took a big tumble on Thursday on the back of renewed concerns about inflation and some hawkish comments from Fed officials, but managed to finish with a new high. Had a same similar up and down situation for the U.S. yield curve. Check in our proxy for U.S. interest rates, the 10 year bond. Opened the week at 4.3%, had a high at 4.4%. A low was the open at 4.3% and finished at the highs of 4.4%, up 10 basis points. I like this direction. We need the 10-year the above 5%. We still have an inverted yield curve from one month. 
usually a sign of recession. The only reason we're not in recession right now is because of massive government spending, huge increase in government spending with a huge associated increase in debt. Federal outstanding debt for the month of March was up $193 billion. Just like we talked about the consumer, the government's just saving as well, and it, can, it continues. So we have this influx of these e illegal immigrants and a huge transfer of wealth from the government to these to these individuals so they can eat, clothe themselves, and house themselves. Very unfair to Americans who are struggling, of course. And that, that boosts nominal GDP, for sure. Quick segue here, though. Nominal GDP is not the measure we look at for growth. We look at real GDP and per capita GDP. Nominal GDP rises just because you give more money. Remember, the government is going into debt to give money to illegal immigrants so they can spend money in the economy, and that boosts nominal GDP. Real GDP, though, adjusted for inflation is falling, and real GDP per capita is also falling. And so not good news there. And the 10-year the should reflect some of this. Check out the foreign exchange market, U.S. dollar index. It opened the week at 104.83, which was the high for the week. The low was 103.92. And it closed at 104.29. So a little off the highs there, a little unusual. Last week, dollar strength was emerging quite obviously. Reassess that as we finish the week here for the U.S. dollar index. And then last, we'll check on the commodity index, the Dow Jones commodity index. Opened the week at 1,000. Had a high in the week, 1,025. The low was the open at 1,000 and closed at 1,022. Up 22 points for the week. This is largely driven by energy and some commodities like cocoa, which is at all-time highs as well. Then before we get into our conversation about the earthquake, you've been playing Powerball? we got billionaires being made every month now with these lotteries. Mega millions of Powerball. Powerball drawing today, Saturday, April 6th, $1.3 billion. Cash value is $608 million. Not bad. I would love to be the winner of that. Wouldn't you? What would you do? What would you do with your winnings? Would you retire? Would you create a business? Would you give your money away? I think I would create a business. I think I'd create a business. I'd definitely give some money away as well and support my family in any way I can. But otherwise, probably wouldn't change too much. Wouldn't go buy a giant mansion. All right, the other thing I want to mention is the earthquake in the Northeast in, in New Jersey yesterday. Holy cow, what a bunch of snowflakes. Love to read some of the reactions. And the slow responses, I mean, Mayor Adams in New York City, I think he put out an earthquake warning about 40 minutes after the earthquakes had, had passed. It was only lasted for 20 seconds. And if you think of people in earthquake zones like Japan, they must just be laughing at Americans in the Northeast today. Obviously, very unusual. You can see some videos where you can see the shaking. You can see people in television studios at, working at the time who could feel the shaking. But uh, the reaction is it was quite funny. <laughs> all, the, all the snowflakes we have, all the panic with respect to earthquakes. I spent some time in Japan, and they have earthquakes regularly. And it is an alarming, alarming thing, especially in the middle of the night, no question. But uh, a 4.8 here, uh, pretty minor. And um, <laughs> it was funny to watch to watch Americans in the Northeast who are unfamiliar with this, obviously, right? So it, it comes from lack of experience, reacting in a very alarmist way. Thankfully, all is well. No apparent damage. Everyone survives. And, you know, we're going to have some chuckles about it. There's some great memes out there about how much how much people panicked. All right, that's all I have for you today. Always try to buy American.